Warlocks of the Ten Shadows have a unique bond with their patron. Rather than simply borrowing power and using that power to perform magic, these warlocks summon aspects of the patron into the mortal world to fight alongside them. Oh, and for anyone who's seen Season 2, yeah, I made him for this, so stick around till the end, you'll see it. So, what happens if we bring that into D&D, and make the Zenin Clan's Ten Shadows technique into a warlock subclass? Well, that's exactly what we're doing on this episode of the Game Master's Domain. Look, I just really wanted to do some more JJK stuff, so yeah, let's do it. Let's make the Ten Shadows Warlock. Demon dogs. Oh. He'll let us know if the curse gets close. So before we actually do any of this, we need to understand what exactly the Ten Shadows technique is, and how it's different from, like, normal conjuration magic. This will also kind of explain why I went with Warlock and not anything else. So as someone who's still pretty new to JJK, the best way that I can describe the Ten Shadows is kind of like a series of family pets that the clan passes down, and certain members of the family are able to summon these pets and control them for combat. They do this by forming contracts with these spirits and feeding them cursed energy, kind of like giving your dog treats when they do something good. Except this dog is two dogs, and the thing you want them to do is go tear that monster over there to ribbons, which they are more than happy to do for some of that cursed energy. That's also how these summons are different from spells like Summon Demon or Summon Shadow Spawn. You aren't just summoning any demon. Whenever Megami summons the Divine Dogs, they're the same dogs, and if one of them dies, then they're dead, and those abilities are passed on to another one of the summons, never to be summoned again. Okay, now we can actually get into the details of how I turned this summoning technique into a summoning-based subclass for the Warlock, since I'm pretty sure there isn't one already, at least not one that's as focused on summoning as this one. Summoning in D&D has always been weird for me, and a lot of the times it really doesn't even seem like it's worth it. They usually take your action to summon, and either your action or bonus action to control. And if you somehow lose concentration, they can just turn on your party if they feel like it. So how about we fix that? But before we can do that, we have to go through spells, so I'm just gonna lightning round them off of you. Uh, some of these are better for you, and some of these are better for your summons. First level spells you get Alarm and Find Familiar for some little guys. Second level spells, Find Steed for a bigger boy and Warding Bonds to protect them. For 3rd level spells, you get Spirit Guardians to protect yourself, and Blink for more protection. 4th level spells, you get a Panic Button in Banishment and Guardian of Faith. And finally, for your 5th level spells, you get Hold Monster and Summon Celestial. A little teaser for something you get later. Whew! Spells done! Uh, now hopefully future me can actually keep up with the graphics on screen. Now we can actually look at the cool stuff and how you summon any of your 10 Shadows. And first thing you'll need is your 1st level feature, the 10 Shadows Summoning. Whenever Megami summons any of his shadows, he has to do a certain, like, symbol with his hands, which changes depending on which one he's summoning. So, let's make that an action to actually summon one of your shadows, since, you know, it takes up both your hands. But after this, it's only going to take a bonus action to tell them what to do. Right now, you can only have one shadow out at a time, which will change later once you get stronger, and you have to concentrate on them like it was a spell. So unlike other Warlocks, you won't really be able to use a lot of those long-lasting concentration spells that they like to take. Now as for actually summoning your shadows, I kind of struggled at first with how to summon them. Do they cost spell slots or something else? But I just ended up giving you a number of summons equaling half your charisma modifier. Or if you're in a pinch, you can give up some hit die to summon them, but that's going to get costly pretty quick. And that's because you have to be a certain level to summon certain shadows and every time you summon a shadow with your hit die, you have to expend a, an amount of them equal to their prerequisite level. Which is at minimum 1, but I mean, you are level 1 right now, so yeah, that's all of them. But right now, you only have access to the first three of your shadows, and you'll get more as you become stronger and form a closer bond with your patron. Demon dog! This pair of twin wolves are as strong as they are loyal, able to easily tear apart monsters at their master's command, and they can use their powerful sense of smell to track down any target foolish enough to try and run away from them. So a few things, and these things are going to carry out through all of your summons. They get a bonus to their AC, 
skills, saving throws, and attack rolls based on your proficiency bonus. That's what the PB here stands for. And I'm only really going to mention things that I can't put here or that aren't fully explained on the graphic. Like that for this summon, you get two wolves, which are going to have more HP than you until you get a few levels in. Honestly, these are really strong for level 1. Which is fine since most campaigns start at level 3 anyway, where it will be a bit more balanced, but I just wanted to mention that. They have good HP, speed, advantage on attacks if they make it within 5 feet of you or the other wolf, and a really good sense of smell. But even as you get higher in levels, the Divine Dogs are still going to be able to hold their own, and will never really be a bad choice. Lui. A pair of fierce birds infuse with the power of a storm, charged with lightning as they soar into battle. These hawks use their great speed to bombard the targets with relentless attacks. The Stormhawks are actually tied for first with your fastest summon, even if they are a good bit squishier. But they can also just leave combat if they want because of their flyby ability, and then dive back in and smack something with their lightning-infused wings. But no, they are not big enough for you to ride. At least not yet. They also make really good scouts, and being so fast, they're great for surprise attacks, dive bombing whoever you want like someone taught Noctowl Volt Tackle. We're out of here now! Let's go! You know, I really hate frogs. Well, that's too damn bad! This toad's acidic saliva, long tongue, and strong jumping ability help it to fight and stay at mid range. If we're just counting single numbers, this toad is the tankiest out of your first three summons, and it's the fastest swimmer, even if it's pretty slow on land. This is also your first summon that has a saving throw of some sort, and for any of your summons that use a saving throw against a target, it's not going to be against the summon's stats, but instead the DC for like a grapple check or anything else is going to be based on your spell save DC. So you might want to prioritize getting your charisma up for more than just extra summons. Now, this toad's tongue does do extra poison damage, and after it grapples them, if it hits them with the tongue again, it does extra acid damage this time. Just to mix up the damage a little bit. I can kind of see the swamp toad being the redhead stepchild of, the, of your first few summons, but don't sleep on the toad. When you need him the most, he will come to your rescue. And that covers the first three summons that you get when you take this subclass. But you can't quite get the stronger ones yet. You've got a lot of training to do before you can summon your bigger shadows. It's one thing to just summon them and let them go to work, but you need to be able to use them as more than just a stack of hit points. Sure, they might only last one minute, but they can do a lot of work and cover a lot of ground in just that one minute. So wouldn't it just be really cool if somehow you could go with them? Well, I'm not sure if this is something Megami has in the show, but I kind of took some creative liberties with how his domain expansion works and made this, the Liquid Shadow feature, which lets you jump into your summon's shadow when you summon it, letting you move with them, see and hear through their sights, and be in full cover as long as you're inside. So you're pretty safe while in there, for a bit. If the summon ends, you obviously are shunted out, but a bit more worrying is that if your summon ends because it dies, then you take any remaining damage. So it's safer, but not really safe. You can also hop in or out of your summon's shadow as a bonus action. On top of Liquid Shadow though, you also get three more shadows to summon, and these are a good bit stronger than your first three, starting off with the Great Serpent. Orochi. This giant snake strikes silently from the shadows, squeezing the life from its targets and holding them in place for its master to finish off. This is your first large summon, and I mean, it, it's a big snake, but even though it's big, it's still pretty sneaky, since it is fully invisible when in the darkness. And as you can see, it has the stealth skill, so it's going to be pretty hard to detect. There's not a whole lot left to say though, it's pretty simple, so um... Go give out some free hugs with your new snake. Max Elephant. Ah! 
This massive elephant seemingly contains a bottomless amount of water within its body, which it can release at high pressure from its trunk to flood the nearby area and bludgeon enemies. And with the Max Elephant, we go from large to huge right away. And he is a chunky one. Almost 80 hit points and over 20 strength with a trampling attack and a geyser of cursed water that shoots out in a 30 foot line. Yeah, the Max Elephant is a tank. And if you set it upright with a trampling charge into a stomp, it can deal a good amount of damage at the same time. Rabbit escape! A horde of small, identical white rabbits that reproduce quickly, swarming over large groups or massive monsters, and tearing them apart with a seemingly endless stream of tiny bites. From the size of an elephant down to a little bunny, we have the escape rabbits. And that might be a bit confusing, since, well, it's a rabbit, but it has almost as many hit points as the elephant. Well, that's because this is a swarm of rabbits, and it is a big one covering a 40-foot diameter area. Its stats are nothing special really, but its abilities let it be a really big nuisance slowing down anything in the area, and it is able to attack any creature within that 20-foot radius. It also heals every turn, and if the creature happens to be large or huge, it can make multiple attacks on a single creature. Which is going to get more ridiculous as we go. Now, with the HP sponges of the Max Elephant and Escape Rabbit around, your other summons might start to feel a little bit less useful, so I took a hint from the Conjuration Wizard for your level 10 feature, Shadow Barrier. But this doesn't just affect your Shadow Summons. This works on any creature you summon with a Conjuration spell, including whatever you summon with Find Familiar. So even your little imp with 5 HP will be better off, since they are now getting extra HP equal to your Charisma score whenever you summon them. So, anywhere from 10 to 20 additional temp HP to help keep them in the game just a little bit longer. You also don't need to worry about getting hit so much anymore, since at least for your Conjuration spells and your Shadow Summons, your concentration on those cannot be broken by damage anymore. But your other spells can still be broken. Now, I tried really hard not to make these abilities too strong while also still being interesting, because, uh, things are gonna get a little bit crazy with your last four summons. So, let's get into the ones you get here at level 10. <laughs> this large, moose-like deer interrupts the weave around it creating a field of wild magic that affects everything except for its master. The deer can also absorb magical energy and use it to heal itself or others with a touch. The round deer, or moose if you want to call it that, either way, is giant. And while it doesn't have as many hit points as the max elephant or the escape rabbit, it does have its own healing. And good luck hitting it with a spell. Since its wild magic field makes spells go wild, and the deer heals five times the spell's level, every time that happens. Oh, and it can cast Counterspell at 3rd level for free, up to 5 times, because screw other casters. The Wild Magic Field is only a 30 foot radius, but still, that's fairly large, and if you put it next to a caster, they're probably not going to get away from it very easily. Also, the Wild Magic isn't guaranteed, it is an opposed skill check, so if they're a wizard, it's going to be their intelligence versus your charisma. The Piercing Ox charges down its targets with immense speed and power, gaining more speed as it runs, and the longer this ox is allowed to charge, the greater the damage that will be dealt whenever its attack does eventually land. And here we go. This is the summon that the Stormhawk is tied for in speed. Although not really, this ox is a beast and is able to dash as a bonus action, and deals extra damage the more it moves. It's also a siege monster, so it is the perfect living battering ram. No, no, it, it's not a ram, it's an ox. Come on, read the name. Overall, another pretty simple summon. It's just a big ox, and it really wants to hit something with its horns. 
The burial tiger hunts undead ceaselessly, consuming their bodies and adding their strength to its own. Its claws and fangs are particularly effective against the undead. The burial tiger is, well I was going to say arguably, but honestly, no. This is the second strongest summon, full stop. It has a bunch more HP and damage in a fight, but it also doesn't really have any uses outside of one. The dogs are good at tracking, the hawks are good for scouting, and the other ones can be used for interrogation, escape, healing, but the real tiger is just a monster built for fighting. Critting on a 19 or 20, healing whenever it kills something, and dealing extra damage to undead. But there is one stronger summon, which we'll get to. So as far as summons go, your shadows are pretty strong, or at the very least useful in different situations. But you know, wouldn't it be nice to have one more? And I'm not talking about your Divine Dogs or Stormhawks. But what if you could have multiple of your shadows out at the same time? You could have four extra monsters fighting in your side, or just two really strong ones. Well, your final feature, Shikigami Garden, lets you do just that, letting you summon multiple of your shadows at the same time. So you could have both your Divine Dogs and your Stormhawks out, or your Burial Tiger and your Toad if you wanted. The combinations are... Well, not endless, but still. So yeah, you can now have two different shadows out at a time, and they are under the same concentration, so you don't need to worry about that. On top of that, if for some reason you do still get hit, despite having two to four summons, and being able to hide in their shadow, whenever you take damage, you can just swap places with one of your summons and have them take that damage for you. And pairing that with the round deer and this last summon, you might kind of end up as a little bit of a raid boss. He grips sword. Divergent seal the divine general. Maharaga. Maharaga, the divine general, is the largest single aspect of your patron that you can summon to a plane. Its body rapidly adapts to damage each time it is summoned, and its weapons can pierce even the strongest of hide or armor found in the mortal world. Yep. Good old Maharaga, giant, towering, and terrifying beast that is the strongest thing the Zenin clan has ever forced into their control. And if you're looking at the stats, yeah, he's a beast. The most HP of any summon, the most damage, the ability to gain resistance to a damage type, and if you keep smacking him with that damage anyway, he just becomes immune. His weapons flat out ignore resistance and treat immunity as resistance anyway, all while dealing over 40 damage with every hit. So yeah, pair this with the round deer for some healing, and unless your enemy is very, very flexible, you're gonna end up being the big bad. Remind me never to make 10 individual monster sat blocks for a subclass ever again. And don't get me wrong, this is one of my favorite subclasses I've made. It's super interesting, and I like it. But working through making 10 different monster sheets on the home brewery gets to be a lot. But other than that, this was great. I got to binge the last few episodes of JJK that I hadn't seen and um, make this. Unfortunately, there wasn't actually any um, proper footage for the last three out of four monsters, but you know. Anyway, though, um, if you like homebrew stuff, subscribe to the channel, like the video, I make one of these every week, I do shorts every day, and we're doing a new video, trying to do a new one every Thursday as well. And those ones won't really be homebrew focused, unless they're a campaign video done by Metal. But yeah, that'll, uh, that'll do it for today. I will see you guys next time, and as always, have a wonderful day.